I'm going to go. David, I'm starting. Um, <coughs> can I ask you to please <coughs> take your seats because we are going to uh, start. Um, good afternoon, I'm Hale Svandiari. I run the Middle East program at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for <laughs> Scholars. Welcome to today's meeting on enemies or allies in the new Middle East, Turkey, Iran, and Saudi Arabia. Uh, this meeting is part of a an ongoing series of meetings we have had um, for a whole year since the beginning of the revolutions in uh, Tunisia, um, Egypt, Libya, uh, and Yemen, and also the ongoing events in uh, Syria and uh, Bahrain. Um, our speakers today are uh, David Ottaway to my left. He's a senior scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center and the <coughs> former Cairo Bureau Chief for the Washington Post. We have uh, their, the bios of the speakers are distributed, so I'll be very brief. Um, David's... Uh, last paper as part of our occasional paper series was uh, Saudi Arabia in the shadow of the Arab revolt. We have a few copies still left. They are outside. We um, urge you to pick one on your way out. Our uh, second speaker is uh, Andre Barki, a former fellow at the Wilson Center. He's professor of international relations at Lehigh University. And um, he, I just received a copy of his latest book, Iraq, Its Neighbors, and the United States, which he co-edited with Phoebe Marr and Scott Lazensky. Um, our third speaker is Trita Parsi. The, he's the president of the Iranian, uh, the National Iranian American Council, a former public policy scholar at the Wilson Center, and his upcoming book, A Single Role of the Dice, Obama's Diplomacy with Iran, will be coming out in the new year, and we have planned a book talk for uh, Mr. Parsi, in uh, February. Um, I think I will stop here. I will ask each of our uh, speaker to speak for 15 <coughs> minutes so we have enough time for a discussion. And there is an <coughs> overflow in on the fourth floor. We will take questions in writing from the overflow. Uh, David, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I'm going to focus on the uh, recent rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Turkey and look at it from the Turkish viewpoint more than, uh, from the Saudi viewpoint rather than the Turkish viewpoint, which I have a feeling Henri will deal with later. Um, I, I think the first thing that strikes me about this r new relationship between Saudi Arabia and Turkey is that if you look at their history, histories, you would not immediately say they might ever become friends. And this was really brought home to me earlier this month. I was in Riyadh for a conference and the, organized by the Saudi Foreign Ministry, and they took us to the history of um, what they call it, Museum of Natu Natural History, which is really the whole history of the Arabian Peninsula back to the, the Big Bang when the, the world began. But there's a whole section there on, uh, on the three Wahhabi states and um, 
And, and, and there's quite a bit about the relationship between, let's call it Saudi Arabia today, and uh, the Ottoman Empire. And there, <coughs> there was a startling reminder to me of how these two have uh, historically uh, interacted and uh, been enemies and foes. Um, just, to, just to mention a few things. The Ottoman Empire, in its struggle with the Portuguese, established an outpost in El Hassa Oasis, which is an eastern province, in 1551 and stayed there until they were driven out uh, until 1680. Mecca came under Ottoman rule starting in 1517 and fought the army of the first uh, Wahhabi Saudi state. I call it the Wahhabi Saudi state because it's an alliance between a religious leader and the Saudi family, and that's how the whole thing got going and uh, <coughs> continues until this day. Uh, but that started, the, the, this, the first Saudi state began forming in 1744 and immediately um, went to war against the armies of the Ottoman um, Empire. The Ottoman Sultan put Muhammad Ali, an Albanian ruler of Egypt, in charge of, of uh, regaining a control of Mecca, the holiest site in the Muslim world, that had been lost to the Wahhabi Saudis in 1803. In 1818, uh, Muhammad Ali's son Ibrahim uh, reached Daria, which had been the capital of the first Wahhabi Saudi state. He captured it and destroyed the first Wahhabi Saudi state. He, worse than that, <coughs> he sent its, its, Amir, its Amir Abdullah back to Constant, Constantinople to be executed. So that's quite an uh, interesting history to the whole relationship. And then the Ottomans were in control of the Hejaz, where Mecca is located in the western part of the western coast of Saudi Arabia. Um, until 1916, when the sheriff of, Mecca, sheriff of Mecca went into revolt with the help of T.E. Lawrence, and eventually <laughs> um, he, he tried to set up a kingdom there, and then the Saudis captured it in, in 1924. Anyway, um, the point is that this relationship between Saudi Arabia and Turkey carries a lot of historic baggage and helped them help keep them uh, apart for many decades. But all this began changing after 9-11. And this was because of three developments happening simultaneously during the past decade. First was the fallout from 9-11, which I'll discuss shortly. The second was the AK party coming to power in Turkey in 2002. And the third was Iran accelerating its nuclear program. Now, <coughs> What happened after 9-11, as you all may remember, there were endless debates both here and in Saudi Arabia about whether we saw each other as friends or foe because the 15 of the hijackers were from Saudi Arabia and Osama bin Laden was behind it. And uh, there was a lot of tension in the relationship and the Saudis decided they had to go look for allies elsewhere than the United States. And indeed they did. And when Abdullah formally became king in um, 2005, one of his first trips, first was to Beijing, just to indicate where they <laughs> were really thinking they were going to get major help. But in August 2006, he went to Istanbul. And this began uh, a whole series of exchanges between the senior leaders of the two countries. <coughs> Abdullah Gul, who has been both Prime Minister and President of Turkey, had spent eight years in Jeddah working for the Islamic Development Bank. So they, uh, he knew Saudi Arabia and they knew him. Um, so, I mean, there was a huge flurry of diplomatic contacts and relationships between the two. But I think that initially the, the, the um, motives were quite different. The Turks were looking for new business up as t Turkish foreign policy is very much driven by its economic policy and its trade policy. They were looking for new, mar new markets. But the Saudis, right from the beginning, were looking for a Sunni counterweight to, e to Iran. 
unfortunately, Turkey's policy of zero problems with all its neighbors um, kept Turkey from really coming out on the side of uh, on the side of the kingdom in the feud between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Furthermore, the Turkey was buying gas from from Iran, and they had a lot of economic um, relations, and the Turks didn't want to, I mean, we'll hear more from Henri about this, but um, seemed anxious not to alienate Iran. Um, strangely enough, things really didn't begin to change until the Arab Spring, the beginning of this year. And <coughs> one by one, the Turks and the and the Saudis found themselves more or less on the same side eventually in Libya. Uh, it took Turkey a while to come over to the, to the side of the rebels there, and the Saudis were behind them right from the beginning. But more importantly, Syria, where they're now both on the same side, working with the opposition to overthrow the al-Assad uh, regime, though not for the same reasons, I don't think. Um, in the case of Turkey, I think it's more personal betrayal uh, by Assad of uh, Prime Minister Erdogan and the promises he made to Erdogan and didn't fulfill. And the Saudi position is really to eliminate Iranian influence in Syria and sort of get even uh, for what happened in Iraq where the American invasion uh, created a you know, a Shiite-dominated government tilting towards Iran, from which uh, which was a major loss in the Saudi constellation and thinking about the Arab world. Um, so here they are on the same side, um, fighting to overthrow the Assad government, and then in early uh, in September. Turkey decides that it's going to host the NATO early warning anti-missile system um, aimed mostly against Iran. Uh, and this publicly puts Turkey on the Saudi Arab Sunni side of the Saudi-Iranian conflict. And I think that's really a major turning point in, in the whole relationship because that's where Turkey really commits itself militarily to being on the side of the, of the Saudi side, the Arab side of the conflict. Um, now, you, you might ask, so how solid is this new rapprochement between the Saudis and the Turks? In my view, it's mostly based on immediate state interests, and it mostly has political rather than security meaning for the, for the kingdom, for the Saudi kingdom. Yes, it's true the Turkish decision to host NATO early warning system is mil militarily important to the Saudis. But Turkey, in my mind, simply cannot replace the United States as the ultimate guarantor of the kingdom's security. And I think Turks are very unlikely to be called upon to ever send troops into the kingdom because of their past history if it really comes to a military showdown between uh, Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia. I think they're much more likely to look for the Pakistanis and even the Americans to come defend them than they're going to turn to Turkey for their, for their um, protection. So you have a kind of double, officially, you have the Saudis welcoming Turkey's new engagement in the Arab world and saying they see no competition for leadership. Unofficially, I think the Saudis remain very wary of the Turkish bid for influence and leadership in the Arab world. One, because of the historic baggage between the two. Uh, secondly, the Turkish model of multi-party democracy, even if it's Islamic-oriented, is anathema in the kingdom. They're not interested in any form of democracy. Um, and then you get these vibes when you see I've had occasion during the Jidda Economic Forum in March, Erdogan gave a speech before a largely Saudi audience and spoke for 20 minutes about the wonders of the new Turkish government and what they were doing overseas, et cetera, et cetera. 
At the end of his speech, he got hardly any applause at all. And I was really struck by <clears throat> the lack of excitement um, in the Saudi audience for Erdogan. Um, and then there's some other there's some other strange things going on. The Saudis ambassador to Ankara, the last one left in early this year, and the Saudis have not replaced their ambassador uh, there. They've named him, but he hasn't gone back for reasons that remain somewhat obscure to me, except it may have to do with the changing of the guard and the Saudi leadership at the highest levels. Um, but I think there, are, there is some tension between the two. Um, anyway, I, I expect you will see a lot of publicity about this new relationship on both sides because it suits their interest. And there's no doubt about it that the, the Turkish turn against Assad is really big news for the Saudis because the king has all kinds of reasons that he wants to get rid of Assad and the Alawite government there. Um, so I, I think what you'll see is <clears throat> the two will line up uh, depending on the issue. Uh, Iran will help keep them together. And to me, it's not impossible that they'll begin working together in Iraq to help the Sunni faction of the, uh, of, of the Iraqi equation have some say and voice in the government there. Um, I would say that what we're seeing is all about Arab realpolitik, not ideological affinity or promotion of democracy in the Arab world uh, behind this alliance. Uh, but it, it is important, and particularly to the Saudis, and um, one of the major new developments in Saudi Arabia's um, search for allies around the world. Thank you, uh, David Henri. <clears throat> um, thank you, Hadi, for inviting me. Uh, as I was preparing for this uh, for this presentation, the, the title kind of um, made me think. We keep talking about friends and enemies. Uh, it seems to me that maybe we need to come up with a new word to explain sometimes things. I kind of, the only word that came to my mind was acquaintances, but uh, <laughs> that was not exactly very <laughs> satisfying either. But this is essentially, um, th th in many ways, captures more probably the essence of the relationship between the three. That is to say that we're not talking about friends and we're not really talking about enemies. We're talking about states that are making do with what they have uh, in front of them. And in fact, when you look back, um, not very far back, actually, to 2010, people were talking about this great uh, Turkish, Syri uh, I'm sorry, Turkey, yes, Turkish Syrian Iranian axis. And now we, we see people talking about a major rift between Iran and Turkey. And the fact of the matter is that events happen. Yes, some of them are momentous, and there's no question, and these are very uncertain times uh, for the Middle East. But Things will change, and, and, and these countries will adapt, and I think there is probably what really exists there is an enduring competition, competition for resources, competition for influence, competition for um, just to be able to say, I, I am the number one uh, in, in the region. There's no question that with the Arab Spring uh, and the Iraq, Iraq war, three countries now have essentially been taken out of the current equation, Iraq, Syria, and Egypt. So they do not have any influence at the moment. That leaves essentially three contenders, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and, and Turkey. And of these, obviously, the Saudis are the only Arab country. And in many ways, the Saudis see uh, themselves very much in a do-and-die confrontation with the Iranians. Partially it's sectarian, partially it's, in, it's nuclear. They see the, the emergence of um, the new Iraqi state as a major, major loss for, for, for their own strategic position. They resent the fact that here's an Arab country run by Shia uh, prime minister and has occurred for a, for a president. Um, and uh, by contrast, they may, may take uh, some, uh, as we heard from David, some great uh, relief from the fact that Iran's main um, friend, 
if you want, uh, uh, ally. Syria is in deep, uh, deep trouble and is about the regime may, there, uh, may collapse. So, and with it, of course, that would be a serious blow to not just to, um, uh, to Iran on Syria, but also with respect to Hezbollah, which has been um, Iran's great arm for both deter deterrence and punishment for anybody it did not like. Um, so, uh, both in Syria and Iraq, you see the Saudis at loggerheads. In come the Turks, and you can look at the Turks maybe as a potential balancer. It is, after all, a Sunni country. It is ruled by a party that is uh, has religious roots that are Sunni in in um, in, in feeling in orientation. Uh, but it is also not exactly an Islamic country. It is a secular country, and the Prime Minister went around the Arab, uh, uh, a tour, kind of a victory tour in North Africa, basically saying that, uh, you know, to individuals cannot be secular, but governments and systems have to be secular. So, so it, is, it is a government that is in Turkey that is actually still a member of the West, uh, has alliances with, with the West, but Ha is increasingly playing a, a, an important role in foreign policy, both uh, in the region and, and beyond. And in fact, when you look at Turkish foreign policy, it has really two drivers. Um, number one is that Turkey wants to be an important global player. It's not just regional. It, uh, the, the region, in some ways, is a stepping stone for, for greater um, glory, if you want. Uh, the Turks are now part of many international institutions. They're part of the G20. They were in the Security Council. They're trying to go back into the Security Council. They're playing, trying to play an international role. But clearly what has happened in the region in the Arab Spring has opened up many new opportunities. The, number two, the other driver, which David alluded to, is commercial. And here the Turks... When you look at the Turkish economy, and if you uh, I don't have the chart with me, if you look at Turkish exports um, since 2000, and this is not, has nothing to do with the AKP, it's a transformation that took place in the Turkish economy, it's almost, um, it goes up like this. It's almost exponential in terms of, 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 the, um, of the rate at which it, it's increasing. And, 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 and commerce exports are critical to, to Turkey. So when, the, when you look at Turkey's um, um, uh, no uh, zero problems with the neighbors policy. It, in many ways, it was driven by this imperative to open up markets, to to sell more things to to um, to to the, to, the, to the neighbors, neighbors which had been in in this AKP government's uh, perception ignored in in previous times, and. To some extent, this need for zero problems, this need to have, uh, to be able to export your wares, has also driven Turkey to be really a very status quo oriented power in the region. It didn't want change, it didn't want chaos. Chaos came, but it, nev it never sought it. And in part, it didn't seek it because it didn't want to, to, to upset commercial relations. So it, when you look at Turkey's relationship with Libya, Turkey's relationship with Syria, Turkey's relationship with all those, the regional countries, it was one of, if, if you want, not zero problems with neighbors, but zero problems with regimes. Right? It's the regimes with which Turkey established relationships. And that's understandable because it is the regimes that control um, um, to control all the access to, to, to trade. Um, but at the same time, I mean, the Turks have proven to be quite uh, pragmatic and adaptable. And when things changed, when relations with Israel changed, for instance, um, or <coughs> they took advantage of it, essentially. They turned, that, they turned that, relation, that deteriorating relationship with Israel to their advantage. They used it in many ways to camouflage some of the changes they made in, in their policy with respect to Libya and Syria. But nonetheless, it, they helped, they used it to garner um, greater uh, sympathy and support on the Arab street, and, and you've, you've heard all this. I, I don't know to what extent I should believe, we should believe them, but there's no question that at least opinion polls, especially the ones that were done recently by University of Maryland and by Shibli Telhami, show that both Turkey and Erdogan are clearly very, very popular on the Arab street. But the Turks have proven to be very adaptable. When, when they first defended Gaddafi, and then, when things they realized that Gaddafi was was a problem, they they switched sides. The same thing is happening with Bashar Assad in the sense that Bashar Assad was the 
poster child, if you want, as somebody used the other day that expression, uh, for Turkey's zero problems with the neighbors policy. From, from, a, from enmity to, uh, they went in 1998 from almost war to a situation where the two countries were talking about two peoples, one government. So much, there, there, there was supposedly so much in, in integration between the two. And yet, um, there was a change. And the change, again, is pragmatism. It isn't that, uh, yes, there's a little bit of peak, as, as David mentioned uh, by Erdogan towards, um, towards Assad, but fundamentally it is a calculation that the Turks made that Bashar Assad is not going to survive. So if he's not going to survive, the sooner he goes, the better it is for Turkey. Because after all, a, a, a country that is mired in, in a civil war or in this, in this type of un, a, in, instability is not likely to be a very good trading partner for Turkey or any type of partner for Turkey. So the sooner Bashar goes, and it is replaced, and the Turks can build a relationship. Essentially, th this is the, exactly the same thing they did with respect to Gaddafi, right, with whom they had very, very, very deep economic and commercial, commercial uh, relations. And you see this change also, by the way, in, in, um, in Iraq, too, where for many years the Turkish government could not even utter the word of the KRG or the Kurdistan regional government. Today, the Kurdistan regional government is one of Turkey's most important trading partners. Um, if you go to, to northern Iraq, uh, just about every other shop is full with Turkish, <laughs> uh, Turkish goods, Turkish banks are there, Tur I mean, everything is Turkish. And it is really in both Syria and Iraq that you see now a three-way, uh, let's call it competition for, the, uh, for, for uh, lack of a better word. That is to say, yes, the Iranians and the Turks are, have kind of carved up Iran, uh, I'm sorry, Iraq a little bit into a... a two zones of influence. In the north, the Turks are far more uh, prominent, far more dominant, um, the, in part because the, the Kurds want it that way too. I mean, they see relationship with Ankara and through Ankara to, to the west as their most important uh, link. The south, uh, the Shia south, is obviously much more dependent on, on, on Iran. And, and the center, of course, is still, if there is any, any influence, it, it, the, um, the Iranians are probably more powerful there. But nonetheless, I think we should not exaggerate either uh, Iranian influence or anybody else's influence in the wake of the American uh, uh, departure from Iraq. I think Iraq is ultimately going to draw its own, uh, its own chart, uh, will chart its own course. And let's face it, Iran, Iraq, do have uh, bitter memories. There's still border issues. There's still the um, the war as a or uh, Iran Iraq war as as a memory. But the point is that there is competition, and clearly the Saudis, uh, as David also mentioned, the Ta Saudis are also involved, and the Saudis are trying to to support this, the, the the Sunni opposition, if you want. The Turks also tried during, after the elections and supported the um, Alawi as, as opposed to Maliki. They lost. So that, that, com that competition will exist. Now, before I talk to Syria, which in many ways is the most interesting uh, case, and I'll conclude on Syria, let me just say a few more things about the Turkish-Iranian relationship. The Turkish-Iranian relationship has gone through ups and downs, but fundamentally it is a relationship that is, is um, uh, solid but unexciting. Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean, the two countries do have very strong commercial uh, uh, ties. I mean, the the the, the Turks buy, the Turks are completely energy depend uh, imp dependent on imports of energy, whether it's from from Russia, which is a primary gas supplier. Iran is the number two supplier, but it's it's not just obviously um, gas that they also import all their oil. And as the Turkish economy grows, that energy need continuously increases, and therefore Turkey is not in a position to alienate the Iranians on on, on energy. Not that they can, uh, similarly, the Iranians have already built the pipelines. It's not, pipelines are not like tankers. You can't just shift their, 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 their um, destination from one day to another. This is a sunk cost. So both countries know that they have, uh, they have to, co to coexist with each other. There have been times when the Turks have been very nice to the Iranians. The Turks never criticized, as is part of the no, no problems, zero problems with your, uh, your regimes, uh, neighboring regimes. They never criticized the 2009 elections. They were with, uh, with Putin and, and Chavez the first to congratulate uh, um, uh, Ahmadinejad on his glorious victory. Um, they, they, during the 
the uh, the pressure the pressure on the United Nations when they were on the Security Council, they came up with a tripartite agreement with the Brazilians that un, um, really um, upset uh, upset the United States and created a huge crisis with with the United States here. But on the other hand, you see, for instance, that the Iranians are now supposedly unhappy about what the Turks are doing in the Arab Spring, especially what they're doing in Syria. I'll come back to that in a minute. And we also heard mention of the defense, the radar that the Turks put, and, and we've heard I Iranian officials saying if there is an attack on Iran, uh, one of the first targets of the Iranian retaliation will be Malatya which is where the, where the radar is going to be put. But you have to understand, there is no radar at the moment, and God knows when that radar is going to come in. So there will be, there will be bombing empty places. Um, but, but let's face it, if you're an Iranian, did, did you think that the Turks had a choice when it came to the radar? Because had the Turks said no to the radar, it would have would have created such a crisis with the United States and the West. It would have been the only country in NATO that um, would have gone against the NATO consensus, but it was certainly would have gone against the United States. And given, because of the Israeli relationship, given the, 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 some of the tension that exists in, in this city, uh, that would have played right into the hands um, of. So the Iranians understand that. So y yes, they will make some noise about it, but I don't think it, it was ever uh, a, a serious issue. But Syria. Okay, Syria is the most important, will be the most important test of Turkish-Iranian relationship. Because in Syria, clearly, I don't need to, and Trita, I'm sure he's going to talk about this, um, Syria is too critical for Iran. And the loss of Syria will be very devastating because it also stops um, access to Hezbollah. But it isn't so much that the Turks have taken a position against Bashar. But it is also the fact that they are actively now engaged in undermining Bashar. The Syrian opposition has offices in in uh, in, uh, in Istanbul. The Turks have been instrumental in helping this opposition come together. They have engaged in some some um, uh, sanctions, but they have, in many ways, it's like the Turkish position on on Bashar, i.e., Erdogan's decision to support the overthrow of Bashar is the good. It's like the good uh, housekeeping seal on on because they were so close. I mean, these two leaders were really part like one family. So for Erdogan to turn around 180 degrees and, and go after Bashar basically says, Bashar, you really don't have any legitimacy. I mean, he, he really, in that sense, carries much more weight. And this is what probably is uh, upsetting the Iranians more. But the question is, if there is a civil war in, 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 um, in Syria, what will the Turks do? Will they intervene militarily? Will they be a conduit? Let's not forget that Turkey, because of its long border, and I would say not just the land border, but also think about the proximity of the coasts between the two. Turkey is the only country that can play a very active role in the event of a de decision to intervene militarily or a civil war, etc. And that's when I think the, uh, the rubble will hit, hit the road and we'll see whether the Iranians react against Turkey and whether that relationship becomes one of enmity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre, Trita, and not the Iranians. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so see? much, Hala. It's a great pleasure being here. Thank you for the kind invitation. As always, you pick the timeliest issues uh, to discuss, and the question of Turkey, Iran, and uh, Saudi Arabia is critical due to their role uh, in shaping the future regional security architecture in the region. And my talk will focus primarily on looking at this from that geopolitical perspective. Uh, if you take a look at the region, you see that Iran has been a long time opponent of the status quo and the American-led security order. Long harboring aspirations for regional preeminence, the current order, or what little is left of it, is antithetical to Iran's interests. It's an order favoring Western-oriented uh, states, and that tends to punish any opposition to uh, American leadership or to Israeli uh, interests. Um, and though one of the most powerful states in the region, Iran is not part of any security arrangement within the region. It has no pact. It is not part of any security body. Um, in fact, most of the security bodies and pacts in the region tend to be created in order to balance and contain Iran. So Iran has no voice, has no seat at the table, and if you are not at the table, then you are essentially on the menu, or at least that's the way the Iranians view it. As such, 
the Iranians have welcomed American decline in the region and taken advantage of Washington's many mistakes uh, in the last couple of years. In the period prior to 2009, the Iranians managed to expand their influence in the region, both by filling the vacuum created uh, by a decline in American power, but also by expanding its soft power base, by challenging very vocally and increasingly unpopular America in the region. On the other side of the spectrum, you have Saudi Arabia, a key benefactor of the old American order. It is an order that has crumbled, and as Washington has come to recognize that the status quo is not sustainable uh, or tenable, Saudi Arabia, along with Israel, has emerged as the two states that are most uh, adamant at pressing the United States at, to resurrect the old order. Because the old order brought with it several dividends that were quite beneficial to the Saudis. It's an order that contained Iraq. It's an order that contained Iran. It's an order that made sure that the West backed the uh, pro-Western governments in the region in spite of their lack of uh, domestic uh, popularity or legitimacy. It's also an order that made sure that the American-Saudi relationship was on a very strong footing and that at least paid some nominal um, um, uh, calls for a resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's an order that created a division between the so-called moderates and the radicals in the region in which Saudi Arabia very generously was put in the definition of a moderate state. But since the invasion of Iraq, most of the deliverables of this order has essentially evaporated. Iran has been unleashed as a result of the defeat of Saddam and the Taliban. Uh, Iraq has uh, fallen into the hands of a pro-Iranian Shiite regime, at least that's the way Saudi Arabia <coughs> tends to view it. Washington has, in the eyes of the Saudis, betrayed its long-term allies, long-standing allies in the region by siding with some of the pro-democracy movements, um, uh, and all of which has resulted in significant tensions between the United States and Saudi. If the defining delineation of the region becomes, and I'm not saying that it's becoming this, but if it does become, uh, based on whether states favor democratization or not in the region, then that would mean that Saudi Arabia would be squarely on the wrong side of history, at least according to the definition by President Obama. Turkey, on the other hand, uh, is a more complicated case, as Henri said. Uh, while Saudi Arabia was a pliant ally of the U.S. who only began openly defying Washington, once it deemed that Obama had abandoned the desire to resurrect the old order, Turkey has been a pretty loyal ally that only turned defiant uh, and assertive in order to hasten uh, and secure a strong position in the new uh, order once it felt that the United States no longer had the ability of turning the clock back. Uh, its current position is largely driven by its sense that Washington's ability to re restore the order is lacking. And now Turkey sees in this transition, and Henry pointed out, in the Arab Spring, an opportunity for itself to expand its uh, leadership and fill some of that vacuum. And there, I think, uh, it's oftentimes been viewed as if Turkey perhaps has become a, a lost ally or perhaps a pro-Iranian power, whereas in reality, it seems much of Turkey's positioning in the region has been aimed at countering Iran's attempts to turn the post-American order into a pro-Iranian order. Recognizing the propensity for hostil uh, hostile rivalry with Iran, um, Turkey has sought a balance uh, that by expanding uh, as many areas of cooperation with Iran as possible. Um, as ancient rivals, the Turks recognize that the damage that this rivalry could do to Turkey's continued rise. And as a state with a foot in Europe, it also recognizes the benefits that come by transitioning the security paradigm in the region towards collective security. Something that would ensure that while you cannot eliminate rivalries, you can tame them and you can make sure that they turn less destructive. The upheaval in the region in the last year has um, uh, put the existing tensions and the divisions between Turkey, uh, Iran, and Saudi Arabia uh, to the fore. Saudi Arabia's quiet quest to contain and box in Iran is now in the open. Uh, private conversations about cutting off the head of the snake uh, seem increasingly part of public policy, particularly now when Saudi Arabia actively is using the oil weapon against Iran. Turkey's no problem policy in attempt to maintain a healthy balance between cooperation and competition with Iran uh, has essentially prematurely ended as a result of what's happening in Syria, as Andre also pointed out. And Iran's endeavor to use its soft and hard power to clinch a leadership role in the region in the aftermath of America's exit 
uh, has fallen behind due to its own treatment of its own population in 2009 um, and the depletion of Iran's regional soft power. Tehran, in many ways, is a regional state that has lost its momentum. And I think there's a few things that can be said about Tehran's reactions, calculations, and maneuvering as a result of this strategic disorientation. After initially underestimating Turkey's intent and capacity, Iran is now recognizing that Turkey actually can and is putting uh, up a very potent ideological challenge to Iran's leadership in the region. While Iranian leadership rested on the idea of Islamic resistance against the now increasingly less relevant West, an approach that enjoyed maximum popularity and support as long as the rift between the Arab populations and the regimes were at its greatest, and at a time when Iran was one of the few states that uh, uh, adopted a defined position vis-a-vis -vis the West, Turkey's assertiveness and bid for leadership rests on its economic policies and progress and its ability to combine a secular democratic political system with a strong Islamic identity. Tehran has in a way been a little bit taken off guard by the rise of Turkey. Um, and you can increasingly see anti-Turkish, anti-Erdogan articles in the Iranian press um, uh, accusing Ankara of pursuing a, a, a neo-Ottoman uh, policy, an argument that you incidentally also hear in some quarters in Washington. And Tehran is increasingly putting uh, Turkey rhetorically in the same camp as Israel and Saudi Arabia, both to warn Ankara about the folly, in their view, of putting its eggs in the Western basket as uh, at a time of American decline, but also to discredit Turkey a bit in the regional audience by lumping it together with Israel. Moreover, you also see that there's been some uh, indications of closer cooperation and coordination between Iran, China, and Russia, uh, particularly after the way Libya ended. The Russians and the Chinese have no interest in seeing the Arab Spring morph into an opportunity to expand the number of pro-American regimes in the region. Their interest lies in ensuring that there is a maximum amount of independent uh, states in the region. Uh, and as a result, uh, seeing states such as Syria or Iran becoming targets is not something that the Russians and Chinese would view lightly. Uh, take the veto against the Syria resolution in the Security Council uh, as a case in point. Um, this has enabled closer coordination between Tehran and Moscow. You can particularly see that over Syria. Whether it's long-lasting or not remains to be seen. In reality, though, I would make the argument that T uh, Tehran realizes that it faces uh, few short-term opportunities to expand its influence. In the short term, Iran is on the defensive. It's on the defensive vis-a-vis -vis Turkey. It is on the defensive to vis-a-vis uh, -vis Saudi Arabia. It is, to a certain extent, on the defensive vis-a-vis -vis the United States, and it certainly is on the defensive vis-a-vis -vis the situation uh, in Syria. But being on the defensive is not necessarily the same as assessing themselves as being weak. On the contrary, I think the Iranians are comforting themselves by adopting a longer-term view where they count on the short-term setbacks of what is happening in the region to be offset by the regional state's natural gravitation from the West, away from the West in the long run, and towards more independent postures, particularly if the national Islamic movements continue to uh, score victories at the ballot boxes. That is, at the end of the day, the way the hardliners in Iran predict that the arc of uh, history will bend. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we'll open the floor now. Um, David, a uh, question uh, to you. After this whole um, incident that the Iranians were trying to assassinate the Saudi <laughs> ambassador then to Washington, in uh, Washington, the Iranian came out and denied it. And just last week, um, the Iranian intelligence minister went to Saudi Arabia. I mean, what do we hear from the Saudi side? The Iranian side, I believe, Trita was relatively quiet about this trip, and it came out first in the Arab press, and then the Iranian had <coughs> to just publish. What? Why did they? What? What is the read of the Saudis? You know, I haven't heard anything about what the Saudi read on that meeting is, but um, the Saudis and the Iranians have, even when relations are really bad have always kept lines open. And we've just seen the two of them cooperate on um, OPEC, um, despite their differences. And um, 
they will continue to exchange messages and talk to each other when things are really so serious that they're in, you know, in danger of conflagration. Um, but the uh, whether or not it's true that they did try to assassinate the Saudi ambassador here, I think the Saudis have a mindset that things like that are to be expected from the Iranians. Um, no, I think you're absolutely right. This was a very controversial visit in Tehran and did not necessarily have the full support of the political establishment, part of the reason why it wasn't initially written about. Um, there was a, a fear that this would come across as if Iran was the weaker party by sending Mosleyi there. There was actually another visit by uh, a deputy foreign minister, I believe, that was supposed to take place that the Saudis canceled. Um, but I think one of the outcomes uh, that the Iranians view it is, is actually the collaboration in OPEC that took place. And one of the factors that apparently led the Iranians to believe that they could go there with uh, somewhat of a strong card was because of uh, the drone situation in which the Iranians were turning to their benefit in the conversations with the Saudis. Um, do you care to comment on each other's uh, presentation? No, the only thing I would say is, in terms of, again, of one thing I want to say about the Turkish position uh, in general, is that I think the Turks kind of enjoy the fact that the Iranians are on the defensive. Uh, the more the Iranians are on the defensive, the more the Iranians will need them, and that's exactly what the Turks want the Iranians. So um, although, the, uh, although the Turks have been very explicit in their opposition to any kind of military action on Iran, for that matter, also they say the same thing for Syria, but the, the fact of the matter is, I, I, I think they like the fact that the world is essentially ganging up, on, ganging up on Iran. And that will mean that the Iranians will need Turkish goodwill more often, and there's going to be a price for that. David? Uh, no, <coughs> just, um, I am not a proponent of the American decline in the Middle East. I have been wandering around the Middle East since 1960, and I never thought I would see the day when Arab countries called on NATO to come in and overthrow an Arab leader led by the two former colonial powers of the Middle East, Britain and France, and, and with the United States doing all the logistics, et cetera. I mean, that to me is just an extraordinary event, what happened in Libya, <coughs> in terms of not the decline, but the return of American influence to Libya, and the calls for no-fly zones. I just came back from Khartoum, Sudan. The opposition there is calling for a no-fly zone. Some of the Syrian oppositions are talking about it. Um, there seems to be no hesitation to seeing the West get reinvolved in helping solve some of these quarrels. When it comes to the Gulf, the United States has just signed a $60 billion arms agreement with Saudi Arabia, the largest in its history. We are going to be providing arms to every uh, part of the Saudi military. Uh, this is an extraordinary development. The Gulf cooperation states have just agreed finally to set up an integrated early warning um, anti-missile system to protect them from Iran. The United States is providing the equipment, the expertise, the training, and I suggest probably the running of this integrated uh, anti-missile de defense system for some time to come. So I don't see America in decline in the Middle East. It's taking different forms. It's, we're, we're trying to go from one type of relationship to another, but Iran has, particularly in the Gulf, Iran has really cemented the U.S. GCC Gulf Cooperation Council relationship. We're opening uh, the floor to your questions. Yes, please. Uh, can you please wait for the mic and identify yourself? Thank you. Uh, Hossein Ibn Yusuf, International Petroleum Enterprises. Thank you all for the wonderful presentation. Uh, David correctly talked about the, uh, the zero problem policies of Turkey, but I'll suggest that Saudi Arabia has basically uh, had similar type of policy under um, 
uh, when uh, uh, Abdullah was uh, actually crown prince, he um, had a rapprochement with Iran um, after uh, Khatami was elected in 1997, tried to resolve their um, uh, land issues with uh, the other neighboring countries, with Oman, with uh, Yemen, with uh, UAE, uh, with Qatar. So um, we see uh, quite a, a different Abdullah now. Um, and, and the policy, the, the shift is, is uh, unbelievable. It's very similar to what we see in Turkey. It, it looks like that there is a match there. Um, but as far as uh, uh, you know, Turkey is concerned, yes, we've seen some sharp uh, moves by uh, the prime minister there. Um, and um, um, I'm, I'm not sure if it's going to be well taken in, in the Arab world. Basically, uh, they would probably see it as a very opportunistic move by, by Turkey in, in that case. Uh, but um, as far as the popularity, yes, he's more popular, but so was uh, Ahmadinejad before the 2009 election. Uh, so it's the durability of that, I think, is kind of questionable. Um, as far as uh, Turkey itself is concerned, no one really mentioned the, the major problems that they have with their own citizens, with the Kurds, that they don't even, you know, consider as a first-class citizen. Uh, but they also had major problems. Uh, you mentioned the, uh, the Ottoman problems and so on, which is true, but they have not been uh, welcomed by the Europeans, and they would never be welcomed by the Europeans. Uh, but also when, uh, uh, with the fall of the uh, former Soviet Union, uh, they were basically rejected in, in uh, you know, other areas in the region, in, in, uh, in the uh, Central Asian republics, basically. Uh, so in fact, I think Iran is probably their, uh, their best option and their very natural allies, it seems. I'd like to... Um, Take your input on that and, and your David, we'll start with you and have each of I'm you I'm not quite sure what the question was. Uh, isn't I Iran is the most natural ally? Uh, uh, look, the, the Arab world today is, uh, because of what's going on in Iran, is more than ever today Sunni versus Shiite. And that's the way, unfortunately, <coughs> you, you might well argue, the way the Saudis are, are, are reading the whole struggle in the Gulf. I'm talking about the Gulf and the Levant, not not the Maghreb. Um, and that's the way the Saudis have decided to play the game. And they're turning it into a, a Sunni-Shiite struggle. And they're not going to allow I Shiite Iran to make any more gains. That's why they sent troops into Bahrain, uh, if they can possibly help it. In fact, they're trying to reverse the whole trend. So from the Saudi point of view, this the sectarian nature of real politique in the Gulf Arab world um, is what dominates. Uh, Andre? Um, <laughs> look, when it comes to Turkey being opportunistic, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with, with, with adopting such a policy. I mean, you try to make, if you have lemons, you try to make lemonade with it. So I, I don't necessarily think it's, it's, it's necessarily a bad thing. However, when you look at the Arab reaction to, to this, I mean, there, is, there, there might be some reaction to, 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 Turkey, to Turkey. However, what the Turks have done, and I would argue that had it not been for the break with Israel, and not just the break, but the stringent, uh, the, or the diatribe against Israel, the delegitimization, if you want, by Erdogan of Israel, that without that, which provides essentially an overarching or a camouflage, if you want, Turkey's, Turkey would not have had that much ease in terms of shifting policies in the region. That helps us, gives it a lot of maneuverability. So yes, yes, there's a lot of opportunism, but it, they've used that, use it very, very well to their advantage. I would agree that the Turks are going to go to quite an extent to avoid any real open hostility uh, with Iran. Whether they would view Iran as a natural ally or not, I, I, I'm not so sure. It's a very different Turkey today than the Turkey that you had 10, 15, 20 years ago with some of the experiences that you mentioned. But I think one of the common threats, perhaps, that both Turkey and Iran face is exactly the type of framing of the region that David presented. That the Saudis have been able to 
drive a very, very hard um, 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 uh, gamble on dividing the region between Sunni and Shia. And earlier on, we've seen similar attempts to dr divide the region between Arabs and non-Arabs. And if you pursue that frame, then Turkey also ends up becoming on the outside of the region. Uh, the Saudis often talk, oftentimes talk about Iranian influence as being illegitimate in, in Arab affairs. Well, Turkey is also a non-Arab state. These type of delineations of the region are going to be problems both for Iran and for Turkey. I don't think it necessarily creates any natural alliances against them, but it, it does show some of the weaknesses of a longer term um, partnership between Turkey and Saudi Arabia. I just, I just want to add one thing. I mean, there's one very odd policy position of the Turks, given how now they've, they've sided with essentially all the, f in favor of change in, in, the, in, in the region, in the Arab Spring. That's Bahrain. They have said absolutely nothing about what's going on in Bahrain, what the Saudi intervention in Bahrain. And so in that sense, maybe there's some maybe they're buying what David is talking about, that, that, that Sunni-Shia divide, or, again, it's very pragmatic, because who cares about Bahrain? It's tiny, it's not that important, and Saudi Arabia is much more important. Uh, yes, please, and then, uh, just, uh, if you could m wait for the mic and identify yourself, and then the gentleman here. Uh, Dave Rogers, Independent Historian. One of the arguments one hears uh, frequently in the Iranian nuclear debate is that if the Iranians get uh, nuclear weapons, uh, all the uh, various other regional powers will start trying to get the nuclear weapons too. Uh, is this a given, or uh, is there, uh, or are there other possible alternatives to? Uh, to what the regional power, the regional countries will do. I'd, I'd like your take on this. <laughs> Getting nuclear weapons is not very easy. I mean, you don't go to Kmart and buy one, but um, the... Um, uh, Pakistan and buy one. Right, that's what I was going to say. I mean, <laughs> may, may, maybe that's, that's the Walmart <laughs> of... Uh, <laughs> Um, so the Saudis may have the may, may have that option. We don't really know what the arrangement is between the, the Saudis and the Pakistanis. But when it comes to the Turks, I mean, the Turks don't have a nuclear um, power plant yet. So if you're talking about building, getting a nuclear weapon, you're talking a very long gestation period. They have to build a power plant first. That will take uh, 10 years, and so on and so forth. Secondly, the Turks do have the NATO umbrella. There are 60... Uh, tactical weapons today under uh, NATO or United States guidance in, in Turkey. So technically they have they are covered by the nuclear umbrella, which also allows them to be far more, you know, when you ask the, the Tur Tur Turkish leadership, yes, you believe in a nuclear-free Middle East, does this mean that you're ready to get rid of your 60 weapons? They say no. So uh, so from that perspective, they, they will have their cake and eat it, uh, eating it at the same time. Twitter. I can just add something to that. I, I don't think it's a scenario that should be dismissed. I think there is a risk for that, and I think uh, it is one of the factors as to why it is important to address the Iranian nuclear challenge with um, um, uh, a lot of good insights and, and foresight. But I think also it is one of the weapons that are used by the states that do want to see the United States to take on a tougher position vis-a-vis -vis Iran to start making indications that they're also looking into their own nuclear program. Because that then com immediately feeds into the argument that we're seeing post-Iranian proliferation, and as a result, it is critical to prevent that by taking on a stronger position vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Uh, but again, I don't. at some points, of course, for political reasons, it may be a little bit exaggerated, but I don't think it is completely unfounded. David, do you want to add something? Yes, it's here. Mona, the... Uh, Ahmed Yüklen from Wilson Center. Um, my question will be related to the first one, uh, you know, going back to the sectarian division problem, um, and kind of two related questions. Uh, over the question of Syria, how Assad is really playing the sectarian card, and to what extent um, do you think he will be able to basically, you know, continue his position, uh, maybe even strengthen his position by playing the sectarian card? 
um, rather than popular demands of changing this regime. Um, and related to uh, the second aspect is um, how Saudi Arabia plays the Salafi Wahhabi actors, not just in the area, but all over, as a force of anti shi propaganda. Uh, to what extent do you see that as a force that Saudi Arabia can play against Iran, not only in the region, which clearly is, as we see with the rise of Salafi movements in Egypt and other places, but to what extent do you see that as a, as a viable sort of uh, tool of policy? Thank you. Uh, yeah, Assad has turned to playing the sectarian card, I think for two reasons. One is he's trying to consolidate his own power we're all in the same boat. Don't think by getting rid of me that you're going to solve the problem of between Shiites and the majority Sunni population in um, Syria. So he too has started playing the, the sectarian card, just like the Saudis are, uh, but for different reasons, obviously. Um, the Saudis are trying to mainstream Wahhabism into to be the mainstream of Salafi thinking. It's a very strong part of their, of their uh, bid. Uh, there's, I mean, there's this whole religious war between Iran and Saudi Arabia, one the leading you know, Shiite power and the other the Saudis, where Mecca and Medina, et cetera, the, um, the custodian of the, of the two holy mosques. So it's uh, very intense, and it has been ever since 1979, and the Saudis play it all the time. Then, then they try and have a national dialogue at home to relieve the tensions between Sunnis and Shia, uh, which is kind of ironic, but they have this national dialogue going on, and they're trying to get the two. So th th they're going in two different directions on this. Only, yeah, um, Rita, you uh, We have 35 people in the overflow, so I'm taking uh, one of their questions. It's, uh, it's to all three of you. Have the influences of individual imams, Islamic religious leaders, increased on any of the governments of Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Turkey? Ali, start with Turkey. Um, Are there religious? I mean, imams? there is. I mean, in in Turkey, you have, you really don't have any important religious leaders ex <laughs> except for one, and that is. Uh, somebody by the name of Fethullah Gulen, who happens to live in Pennsylvania, United States, and has an enorm enormously large following and has media enterprises, businesses, uh, associations. And by and large, uh, Fethullah Gulen's organization, although does not agree with the government all the time, has supported the AKP and has been actually quite helpful to AKP's electoral success. But this is... N they were influential before, but the difference between now and pre-AKP is now they are much more legit. They are up, out, out in the mainstream, and they don't have to hide. I think in the Iranian case, you actually have um, a situation that is somewhat the opposite. I think, though, it's very difficult to make very clear-cut predictions of exactly what the power balance is between various um, um, uh, power centers in Iran. Uh, I think a trend that has been viewed over the last 15 years is actually a decline of the of the influence uh, of the clergy at the expense, of course, um, um, of some other elements such as the IRGC, etc. This doesn't mean that the you know, IRGC is necessarily controlling the country, etc. But uh, there seems to have been a trend away, and you can see greater uh, dissent in Rome uh, against. Uh, uh, Khamenei and, and uh, the current interpretation of Elayat Fari. You have worries in Iran of what will happen uh, in Iraq, in Najaf. Will Najaf be able to emerge as a, uh, a Shiite ideological challenger uh, to <coughs> Qom? Uh, you already have a situation in which there's very little following in Najaf for the type of Iranian interpretation of, of uh, the mainstream Shiite uh, school of thought. Uh, so you've, I think you've actually seen an, an opposite trend there. It's not necessarily sufficient to say that you know, the regime is about to collapse or anything of that kind, but it is nevertheless uh, a different Iran compared to 15 years ago. Well, I'd say the influence is <coughs> it's sort of the same ambiguous relationship the, the uh, Saudi family has had with the um, al-Sheikh, who were the descendants of um, uh, Muhammad uh, Abdul Wahab. Um, they sometimes 
the official uh, establ Wahhabi establishment there is subservient to the government. It's helped the government battle al-Qaeda and extremism in uh, Muslim Islamic extremism inside the kingdom. Um, it's been very helpful in, to the government in that way. On the other hand, they fight each other over whether women should be able to drive, whether there should be an overhaul of education system. So uh, and domestically, you get you get that you have a struggle going on between the the the, the, the uh, Al Saud and Al Sheikh about um, the direction. A number of uh, whether women should <laughs> should be allowed to have sports in their schools. <laughs> Can you believe it? Um, that sort of thing. I mean, they're really in battle with each other. Uh, yes, please. Uh, just the mic is cut. Thank you. Joel Barkin, CSIS. Uh, none of you have mentioned the word Egypt in an hour and a half. <laughs> um, okay. Apologies. In passing. Uh, <laughs> could you then review the three states vis-a-vis -vis Egypt and particularly how the, their take on the outcome of the elections? You want to go first? <laughs> <coughs> I think the Saudi, you know, <coughs> the Saudis want to see stability in Egypt. Um, they're not crazy about democracy, obviously. Um, <laughs> in fact, they used to have strong support from Mubarak um, in struggling with the United States that was trying to push um, uh, democracy on both of them. Um, I think they're very worried about stability there. Um, I think they would prefer to see the military stay there and play continue to play, they would hope, a stabilizing role. And we're, now we're not so sure that they can play a stabilizing ro role, but they'd, they'd, they'll st they would side on the, having the military stay. Um, and, um, and, you know, they've given, they've committed $4 billion since the, this all began uh, to Egypt. Uh, so far they've given half a billion dollars f to help them with their financial situation, which is far from what the Egyptians need, but <clears throat> they've committed to putting in the d up to two billion of the four billion into stabilizing the uh, the, the financial situation of the country. Um, so they're not, you know, not trying to isolate Egypt. Um, now the elections, the way they're going, they're going. It's going to bring the Muslim Brotherhood uh, is going to have the. Uh, plurality of votes and will probably lead a coalition government. The relationship between the Saudis and the Muslim Brotherhood is extremely ambiguous. The Muslim Brotherhood during the first Gulf War sided with Saddam Hussein. This really infuriated the Saudis who had taken in thousands and thousands and thousands of Muslim brethren um, in the 50s and 60s after um, Nasser turned against the Muslim Brotherhood. So here they had sheltered the Muslim Brotherhood for decades, and they felt betrayed by the Muslim Brotherhood during the first Gulf War. Furthermore, they blamed the Muslim Brotherhood for politicizing Islam uh, and, and creating what some people call neo-Wahhabis, which are a, 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 a mixture of, <laughs> of um, Wahhabis and Muslim brethren. Um, but very politically minded. So I don't think they're happy to see the Muslim Brotherhood uh, win as uh, big a, a vote they've gotten. On the other hand, I think they're happy to see the Salafis doing so well because many of the Salafis owe allegiance, uh, ideological allegiance, to uh, the Wahhabis in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Erdogan famously, as you know, called on... Um, Mubarak to step down, and he was seen as one of the first Western leaders to do so. Um, there was never much love lost between Erdogan and Mubarak. He, uh, Erdogan saw Mubarak as somebody who was very much um, 
enthralled, uh, I mean, very pro for the United States, uh, stood in the way of Erdogan's ambitions in the region because Egypt, after all, is the center of the Arab world. When it came to Gaza, it was always the Mubarak who called the final shots and not the Turks as they wanted to. So he, but in, in the final analysis, when it comes to <coughs> Egypt, what the Turks do want is to see Egypt get back together and, and reestablish some kind of stability because Again, the long-term interest with uh, with Egypt is fine, is commercial. They, they, there were a lot of companies that were doing business in, in in Egypt. Lots of textile, Turkish textile companies, had moved to Egypt because of lower labor costs. Um, so, um, and part of Erdogan's comments regarding uh, secularism in terms of the, 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 in the fact that the state should be secular, which angered some in the Muslim Brotherhood. I think had to do with that. It, it was basically saying, "Come on, get on with it, uh, set up your state, and 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 move on." And I think that's what basically the Turkish interest is in is in Egypt. Yes, the fact that Egypt is not a real player in the regional balance of power works to a Turkey, Turkish uh, advantage, but it is also they do not want to see Egypt crumble or collapse. Okay. I think the Egyptian case is very interesting as it shows that some of the initial predictions that the Arab Spring would, uh, particularly with the fall of Mubarak, mindful of how uh, strongly negative he was towards Tehran, would lead to a, an immediate uh, plus for the Iranians. And about a year into it, I don't think we have seen much of that so far. We have not seen the uh, relations be reestablished between the two countries. Uh, that may still happen, but it certainly has not moved at a particularly fast pace. I think uh, looking at the elections, I think the Iranians are probably quite comfortable with seeing the Muslim Brotherhood coming to uh, power in Iran, because in, in Egypt, because they have managed to take advantage of that ambiguity that exists between the Brotherhood and other players, such as Saudi Arabia. Take a, a look, for instance, at the relationship between um, Iran and Hamas. Hamas, who uh, um, uh, earlier on received most of its funding from Saudi Arabia, and then later on the Iranians managed to take uh, advantage of some rifts there mm -hmm. and, and expand its influence uh, in Gaza. I think the Iranians are looking at these things as opportunities, but it has not ended up being that type of a clear-cut victory for the Iranians that I think some people in Washington feared. And I think the, a similar situation may emerge in Syria, in which certainly it will be a loss for the Iranians um, uh, if uh, Assad falls. But I think their relationship with uh, the regime uh, in Syria is not just limited to Assad, it's also extensively in the security apparatus, as well as the fact that even if it becomes a, a loss for the Iranians, uh, it doesn't necessarily automatically translate into a win for everyone else. Most likely, the scenario will be that uh, Syria will turn into yet another one of the weak states in the region that become a proxy arena uh, for the major powers to fight each other, rather than squarely falling into the camp of the other side. Um, yes. Igal Schleifer with the Eurasian website. Um, uh, Henri, you mentioned the um, the crisis that erupted between Washington and Ankara over um, Turkey's uh, dealings with Iran on the nuclear issue, particularly the uranium enrichment deal that they helped broker with with Brazil. And um, it seems like you know, when when you look at the at the issue of of um, actually Turkey and the U.S. aside from the Obama Erdogan chemistry. I think one of the big reasons that have helped bring Turkey and Washington back together has been Turkey stepping away from the Iran issue, at least being a very vocal advocate uh, for Iran. Uh, but you also mentioned that you see sort of as, as things get harder for Iran, possibly them coming back to Turkey. Um, and I'm wondering wh what are the conditions for that happening without it again uh, driving a wedge between Washington and Ankara? So you know, what, 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 how does how does Turkey allow itself to again? start working more closely with Ankara without endangering its closer or improving relations with Washington? Look, I think when you look at the Washington-Ankara relationship at the moment, I mean, everybody will tell you that it, is probably, it has never been so good. And in large measure, it has to do with Syria. Because I, must, I suspect that, that this is where we are seeing probably a great deal of cooperation between the two countries. Not only is Erdogan and, and Obama talking very quite often on this on this issue, and they, as they have another um, on other questions with respect to the Arab Spring, but as I said earlier, whatever happens in Syria, Turkey is going to be critical. The land border, the uh, the, the coastal links, 
So if you are Washington and you are doing some contingency planning, you have to be working with, 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 with the Turks constantly. So there's not that much that will, I think, endanger the American-Turkish relationship at, at, at the moment. What it, there has been some, what, what the Iranians have done, and, they've, and there's been some accusation in the Turkish, uh, in the Turkish press and also by Turkish uh, officials indirectly, that the Iranians have, uh, in order to punish the Turks or to send them a signal, kind of supported the, uh, some of the PKK attacks against um, uh, against Turkish military targets, which were quite effective. I, I think there's a split within the PKK and among between hardliners and, mo and moderate ones. The hardliners have traditionally been more pro-Iranian, so it is possible that the Iranians were instrumental in 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 helping. But even there, I think uh, I think the Iranians will have to be very very careful when it when it comes to that. The Iranians don't want to anger the Turks, but it is not that the Turks are going to do anything against Iran. I mean, they they have the they they want to continue this relationship. There's nothing. It's not a zero sum necessarily relationship between Iran and, and, and Turkey. So what happens in Syria again? That's the that's a, it's very very difficult to to play it out. If there is a Turkish intervention that is designed to overthrow Assad, I think that will be seen by Iran as a very very hostile act. But but beyond that, I don't see anything that will happen. Back, please. I'm Harris from American University. Uh, I was wondering, what's the uh, sort of situation surrounding Hezbollah? Uh, I know that Saudi Arabia strongly supports the anti-Hezbollah uh, units within Lebanon, but then is Turkey going to be playing a role, or you know, will they have some sort of influence in that in the future? Um, I mean, the, the, the Turks... Again, when you look at uh, uh, the whole issue of Syria, and you can't divorce, obviously, Hezbollah from Syria, there's no question that Hezbollah is probably in its most vulnerable situation it has ever been historically, especially if Bashar Assad were to go. Then it is, it's going to uh, encourage all anti-Hezbollah factions to start putting pressure on Hezbollah. Not that Hezbollah is a, is a weakling that cannot defend itself. I mean, it's this most powerful actor in, in Lebanon. But it's, it is definitely going to make life very difficult. And Nasrallah has come out uh, swinging in favor of Bashar. Uh, so there will be also, even if, if there is a regime change in, in Syria, Syria is not going to change its position on, on the Golan, on, on Syria for the most part, but it will change its position on, on Hezbollah precisely because of that. But what the Turks are worried about, and, and they did send a warning uh, about, I think, 10 days ago, basically both to the Syrians and to, to Hezbollah, not to do something crazy in the region. Because the fear has been that that um, in an act of desperation, maybe Bashar is going to use Hezbollah. Not necessarily that Hezbollah is an instrument of Bashar. I mean, I don't think they will do it. But the, the, you, can, you, can, you can create a scenario in which events happen that engages a Hezbollah directly or indirectly, and then you have a firefight over Lebanon between the Israelis and Hezbollah, which would maybe would work to Bashar's advantage in terms of galvanizing pop the public maybe to, or, or, or the region. So that's the Turks don't want to see that. I mean, as much as they don't like the Israelis, the fact is they do not want to see a major conflagration because it's going to work against the whole region and themselves. Uh, Trita, do the Iranian want to see a confrontation? Uh, between... Hezbollah and, uh, you know, Israel. Um, Israel and no, I, in fact, I don't think in the short term that is what they're looking for. In fact, if you take a look at a lot of the different things that have happened with Iran in the last year and a half, they've been struck by Struxnet viruses, assassinations, uh, major sanctions, as well as things blowing up left and right around Tehran and, and elsewhere as well. Uh, I think the real question is, where is the Iranian retaliation? I don't think we're seeing any strong signs of any major things that they're doing, and that raises the question, why, why aren't they doing anything? And I think one reason for that may be that the Iranians are calculating that at the end of the day, however costly these sanctions are, however problematic the sabotage, the Struxnet assassinations are for them, they can still absorb all of this and still outpace the West 
when it comes to their nuclear program because it's still continuing. It's continuing slower than it was before, but it's still advancing. But if they risk a confrontation, if they retaliate on a larger scale, the dynamic may change. And, and they can end up in a much uh, poorer situation. So at this point, uh, I think that may be part of the reasons why they're not doing anything. Uh, but the question then is, how long can they absorb these things without retaliating? Uh, and I frankly suspect that the Israelis are testing that right now. Okay. Um, no more questions? Okay. Let me ask one question to put it to all three panelists. If we had met early December a year ago, the region would have been whatever it was then, very normal. Ben Ali, Mubarak, Gaddafi, uh, Saleh, all that. Where will we be a year from now, speculate? <laughs> will Bashar will be still in place? Will, um, what will the situation be in Morocco, in Tunisia? In a year Canada? from now. Uh -huh. December 2012. Ask him first. Ask David. <laughs> OK, David, you go first. <laughs> Uh, I think what's going to override everything is some kind of more serious confrontation with Iran. If uh, the West goes ahead with its attempts to um, squeeze Iran on oil exports, I think you were talking about when are they going to retaliate, <laughs> um, that this could trigger something. And I know the, the Western governments in the United States are studying in great detail, together with help from the Saudis, about how do you shut down or at least decrease Iran's oil sales without sending prices sky high. And, you know, you call it a, a journalist vibes in the air. <laughs> as you go around the region and talk to people, and I just get a feeling that something's going to happen with Iran that's going to uh, overshadow whatever, you know, the pro-democracy movements in all these uh, Arab countries, and um, this will force people to choose sides and either be on, you know, the side of the United States and the West or the side of Iran. Uh, wasn't it Yogi Berra who said making predictions is difficult, but making predictions about the future is even more difficult? <laughs> uh, look, I, le, le, let me say that Bashar will be gone 12 months from now. Mm. If, if he's not, don't ask me why, but I don't know. But um, I think Bashar will be gone, but the issue I think is going to be chaos in Syria and probably chaos in Iraq, because there's a way in which what's happening in Syria is also affecting, affecting Iraq now. And uh, we see it in terms of the, the, the way the different communities in Iraq are, are positioning themselves. Um, you know, the Maliki government supporting Bashar. After all, what Bashar did in terms of allowing suicide bombers to cross his country to Iraq. Um, uh, by the way, Saudi bombers crossed Syria into Iraq and blowing up Shia uh, targets. So. In, in that sense, I, I think what happens in Syria is going to spill over into Iraq, and it's nat necessarily and nat naturally will pull in other countries to, to play the game. But I don't see a major conflagration. I just see more and more chaos uh, in, in the region. Yogi Bear may have known a lot about making predictions, but he didn't live in the era of C-SPAN. It's much worse making predictions about the future live on C-SPAN. I would say that um, I would tend to agree with David. I think that the big game changer is not necessarily Syria, although of course it would be a very big factor, but it is whether something happens between uh, the United States and Iran. And uh, David mentioned the oil issue. I think that's a very, very critical issue. I would add a couple of other factors t that makes this mix quite explosive and very difficult to control. You have, on the other hand, the factor that uh, politically it would be far less costly for the Israelis if they were to choose to 
uh, embark on a preemptive military strikes against Iran uh, in the midst of an American election year. We've already seen the rhetoric from the re uh, Republican side. Uh, and since the, the tensions with the US over this issue in the, fa in the past has been a very important factor for the Israelis to make a decision, um, I think that's going to be something to watch out for. Um, you also have, of course, the fact that the Iranians are now putting cascades into Fordu. Um, and they will probably be operational sometimes or completed sometime within the next six months. The Israelis are presenting that as a new red line. There's been plenty of red lines in the past that the Israelis have presented and have turned out to be far more pink than red. But this one, in my assessment, actually does uh, have some uh, logical foundation to it because taking out uh, an installment in Fordu is quite different from taking out, since it's 100 meters or so underground, compared to taking out uh, the facility at Natanz, for instance, that is above ground. So uh, if they become operational with 3,000 or so centrifuges at Fordu, it, it would um, uh, ring some uh, clear alarm bells in Washington. And then uh, to add to that, that we still don't have any real uh, sustainable diplomacy that brings about the type of de-escalatory mechanisms that ensures that even if there is a conflagration that you can dial it back. And I think uh, we should listen to what Admiral Mullen said just a couple of weeks before he left office, warning about the risk of an accidental war in the Persian Gulf because Iran and the United States do not communicate, they have not communicated. That lack of communication brings about uh, misperceptions, which leads to miscalculations, which then lead to escalation, as Admiral Mullen would put it. So that, to me, is the biggest uh, game changer in the region 12 months going forward. With that very happy note, let's end this meeting. Thank you. Join me.